Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon for those of you from uh, who are joining from elsewhere. Um, it's a real pleasure again to have Antonio Colombo join us um, to the, on this morning's CAF conference. Um, and I remember when I spoke to Antonio about doing the CAF conference again, we were talking about what to do and what to talk about. And Antonio wanted to, to, once again, as he's always done, challenge the norm about how we treat uh, our patients in the cath lab, as he's done for the last 30, 40 years uh, of his career. Um, and so today, again, uh, I think you're going to give us something that for not everybody may agree with, Antonio, um, but I think it forces us to challenge ourselves and think about you know, how we treat patients with diffuse disease. So I'm really looking forward to hearing your talk. Okay, thank you, Azim. And uh, thank you to all uh, uh, listeners. Uh, the topic is the treatment of diffuse disease, physiology guided spot stenting or no stenting and drug coated uh, balloons. I have uh, uh, no conflict to disclose regarding this presentation. This is what we want to avoid. This is, a, uh, this is not contemporary interventional cardiology. This is an LED with a diffuse disease uh, treated uh, with a full metal jacket uh, that developed diffuse wrist stenosis. This LED is impossible to keep open. You, you can reopen, but invariably, if you wait a few years, it will close again. And uh, unfortunately, the operator did not learn the lesson and placed another super long stent on the uh, OM. And uh, we will know what the destiny of this stent after two or three years. Uh, I say that, uh, I hope not, but uh, I'm a little bit pessimistic. So we try, we want to avoid this way of operation and that are called a new approach. These are start with some, some examples because I believe it's, it's clear. Is a diffusely diseased LAD. In order to get a good result on this LAD, uh, you will have to implant uh, long stents and several stents. Uh, and I'm sure you're gonna get an excellent uh, immediate result. But uh, we took a different approach. I go quickly about the so-called lesion preparation. This is standard pre-dilatation. There is some uh, indentation. You may use a uh, cutting balloon. In this case, uh, we went with Ivus. Uh, we did little tripsy, but you can do uh, rot ablation, whatever you are, you are used. But uh, let's go quickly about lesion preparation, which is uh, basically standard. We did cutting balloon, we did the kissing. So this is uh, after lesion preparation. So at this point, uh, the lesion is ready to be, to be stented. And uh, of course you will place a stain proximally and uh, another long stent more distally and I'm sure you get a, a nice uh, a nice immediate uh, immediate result. There is still some residual stenosis in the distal in the distal part and uh, we placed a stent in this case we placed uh, a bioresolvable scaffold proximally but uh, you can place uh, a meta stent a DS uh, no not the topic of this talk uh, with a good result. But then uh, how do we treat the rest of the LAD? And here is a very long diffuse area. There is a dissection and there is a focal stenosis and there is another area of diffuse disease. Uh, we did uh, uh, baseline, uh, so-called uh, not adenosine uh, induced. Uh, there is a, a PAPD, PA 86, uh, 84, with contrast is 77. Uh, we uh, dilated uh, better the lesion and then we did the drug coated balloon, uh, 2540. And uh, we repeated uh, the physiologic assessment uh, after the treatment is 94, uh, more distal is 91 and uh, when you do give contrast uh, is 87. 
there is a clear dissection, but uh, uh, proximally to the dissection is 94, distal to the dissection is 91, and uh, more distal we have an FEV5 of 87. So we, are, we take uh, the drug eluting balloon as our final treatment, and this is our approach. Focal stenting proximally with a 24 millimeter stent, and all the rest is treated with drug coated balloon. We leave a, a dissection because we have checked with pressure gradient that the dissection is non occlusive. This is another example right coronary artery occluded uh, more distally, reopened. Uh, good balloon uh, dilatation, and then uh, DS proximally in red 3.528, and the long drug eluting balloon uh, more distally at 3038, and uh, uh, no stent uh, in the other part of the vessel. This is uh, another example uh, bifurcation left main, uh, focal LED in B and the diffuse disease in C. Of course, we are not trying to take stenting away from the left main and from the proximal LED, but uh, uh, besides a drug eluting stent in the proximal LED, all the rest is treated with a drug coated balloon. Is a more extreme example, focal lesion in this lady at a bifurcation of a big uh, diagonal, uh, more not so diffuse disease of the right coronary artery, and the LED uh, in the distal part is diffuse disease. In this case, we did a contrast QFR. Uh, the uh, index of this contrast QFR, which is about uh, similar to the FFR, was uh, 0 0.92. I think uh, you really don't need uh, uh, this test to demonstrate uh, that you have diffuse disease and uh, a severe focal lesion proximally, but this is a good documentation. We did uh, uh, balloon angioplasty uh, distally, cutting balloon uh, 3.5 uh, proximally, uh, just uh, wire protection of the diagonal branch. There is uh, some dissection in the mid uh, LED. Uh, we uh, did uh, IVUS to confirm uh, vessel size and distal is, uh, is 2.5. Here uh, you see the various uh, uh, spot uh, more distal in, uh, on the left. Mid uh, proximally is a real big vessel at the bifurcation of the diagonal. As a matter of fact, after this dilatation, the IVUS result looks really, really good. Uh, based on the IVUS evaluation, uh, we did the drug eluting balloon uh, distally, uh, 2040, uh, more proximally 3040. Uh, unfortunately, with the guiding cast, uh, we dissected the left main, so we had to place uh, a short four millimeter stent in the left main uh, to treat a iatrogenic dissection, but uh, this was unconsequential. And all the rest was uh, uh, only treated, uh, not even stenting uh, as a bifurcation. We repeated uh, uh, the QFR, which is only positive in red, very distal, but uh, uh, you see in uh, yellow uh, is a 0.8 and in bluish is close to 0.9 and in very proximally including uh, the bifurcation of the diagonal is above 0.9. So except for the very, very distal LED, everything else uh, is uh, uh, negative. You may remember the former contrast QFR, which was all red. So based on this uh, physiologic assessment, we did not place any stent and the patient was left as it is. At nine months, I show you the angiographic uh, follow-up. Look at the very, there is still a, a non-healed dissection in the middle of the LED. 
but uh, the, the result is very nice. The curves are maintained. The bifurcation is excellent. Uh, the diagonal is, uh, is not pinched. Uh, and uh, I think uh, it's, a, it's a very comfortable uh, long-term result. This is the other projection with the follow-up angiography. angiography. Uh, during that uh, procedure, uh, we uh, treated the right coronary artery. Unfortunately, there was uh, a iatrogenic dissection at the time of the cannulation. Uh, and uh, did, uh, uh, you see this really dissected right coronary artery. No balloons was uh, advanced. Uh, uh, fortunately enough, uh, a wire uh, could be advanced uh, in the uh, true lumen without much difficulties. And uh, uh, at that time, we did not have uh, a pressure wire available. So we used a very primitive uh, system, which is uh, a broken uh, balloon attached to a pressure manometer uh, to measure uh, the pressure. Um, you get a mean pressure with a very uh, damped uh, diphasic uh, waves. In yellow uh, is a diphasic wave in the aorta. In red, you see the diphasic waves uh, uh, in the distal right, which uh, shows an impressive gradient, 60 to 25. Uh, again, is a, a monorail balloon, which has been intentionally broken and attached uh, to the inflation port to a manometer recording uh, the pressure uh, due to the small caliper of the system. The pressure is severely damped, but nevertheless, if you flush the system well, you will see a, a undulating uh, uh, pressure. Based on this finding, we did uh, uh, balloon dilatations uh, with uh, uh, 3.0 balloon and 3.5 more approximately. We did not mean to seal the dissection, basically to make the lumen larger. And after these multiple dilatation, uh, we remeasured uh, the pressure proximally and distally. And we see now that is a 60 proximal is the same, but distally went from 25 to 55 with a, uh, a residual five millimeter gradient. Based on this finding, we did not place any stent, not even proximally, no stent. This patient did very well. Now we are uh, more than two months from the procedure and the patient is, uh, is very stable. We finalized with a drug coated balloon, uh, distally and proximally. And I think we repeated again after the drug coated balloon uh, the pressure, which was uh, again a five millimeter gradient and no stenting. So let me summarize what I called, I call an over approach to limit stenting. The lesion is crossed with two wires, regular wire and pressure wire. Uh, if you have uh, a pressure system which goes over the monorail, like the assist, uh, you do not use uh, the additional pressure wire. I add that the pressure wire can be positioned after predilatation. Uh, if you have a good uh, a steerable pressure wire, you do not need uh, to start with two pressure wires. The lesion is optimally predilated with the goal to reach a good angiographic result. IVUS is optional. But I believe uh, when you treat uh, diffuse disease uh, is a nice tool. And again, please uh, do not uh, uh, take the message that I am against stenting. I am against a full metal jacket. I do not want you to forget about stenting or not to stent. I want you to uh, learn how to stent or not to stent when you have a diffuse disease in order to avoid super long stent. Following predilatation, uh, two 
event can occur. There is an occlusive or advanced dissection, then uh, you have no choice uh, and you go ahead and stent. Uh, the uh, dissected right coronary artery was a dissection, was an advanced dissection, but was not occlusive. So we waited uh, a little bit uh, before going to stenting. Optimal result with or without a dissection, you can have a dissection. Even if you have a dissection, uh, we do not proceed to stenting, but we measure the pressure gradient. And uh, I wrote 10 millimeter. Uh, we are planning to do a prospective study uh, to validate this 10 millimeter. But so far we have 20 patients uh, where we have uh, follow up more than one month uh, with no events. Of course, 20 does not mean much. Uh, we would like to reach at least uh, 100 patients. But uh, I tell you, all of these patients had uh, uh, dissections and none of them uh, occluded. And I believe if they, did, if they do not occlude uh, within uh, 30 days, uh, it is unlikely that they will occlude later. So if the pressure gradient is less than 20, than 10, uh, we proceed with a drug coated balloon. If the pressure gradient is higher, we can do additional dilatations or we can place a stent in the segment where the lesion looks severe and then repeat the pressure gradient in order to limit stenting. This is a, is a work in advancement, is not, uh, uh, see, is not uh, written into stone and uh, we may uh, modify this approach, but uh, is a, an honest attempt uh, to get away uh, from the full metal jacket. I finish here. Uh, maybe I didn't really take the whole time, but uh, uh, that's uh, my message. And uh, we can have more time for questions. I'm sure you have some questions to ask me. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Antonio. Um, it was great. I knew you were going to challenge us with this approach because I know you've been doing it. And um, I want us to be able to show it to colleagues and discuss it openly because I think, you know, it is going to, it does create a lot of discussion, right? Because it's, but I think the first thing is I, I couldn't agree more with you about full metal jackets. Um, I think we have to stop doing full metal jackets. And I still see too many young colleagues reach out for long stents. Uh, and I think full metal jackets in vessels like LAD just have not shown good long-term outcomes. You may get patients out to one, maybe two years even, but to get them out to five years without having recurrent problems um, is a challenge. I have to admit, and Aberhart is also on the line, so we have a, you know, a few good friends. Um, it does feel like we're going back in time now right a little bit i mean we're going from you know we went we had uh, balloon angioplasty and we for years we were teaching that you know stents were used to were invented to prevent acute vessel closure after balloon angioplasty and all the areas you balloon you should think about covering with stents because of vessel trauma and now we kind of almost going full circle going back to doing balloon angioplasty yeah yeah, but let me tell you, first of all, sometimes to go forward, you need to go back. Uh, why, uh, what has changed compared to the Grunzig time, to the old time? We have better tools to prepare the lesions. We have IVUS to really look inside and we can really evaluate what we have done we can evaluate the residual lumen, etc. And we have a physiology, but physiology is done with a very reliable pressure wire, the good system, of course, gives you the pressure. And if the pressure distally is uh, not uh, low, 
you know that you have no obstacle to flow. You may argue what happened in 10 hours, in, in two days. But, uh, you know, that's the reason why we need data. We need to continue to collect data. But believe me, I'm collecting data for you. And so far, nothing happened. I'm very careful. I'm very slow. I only do when I have to avoid full metal jacket. I'm not going to take uh, people that can be treated with a short stent and put them at risk. I only do it when the risk of placing a full metal jacket is, in my view, higher than the risk of uh, uh, doing a control dissection. Eberhard, um, you've been doing this for a long time. Um, I mean, Antonio is again being Antonio. Is, is he just, you know, being Antonio? He's challenging the norm and challenging what we normally do. So, uh, Azim, thank you very much. And of course, always good um, to be with Antonio and listen to him again. And I was wondering what comes up now. Uh, and, um, you know, I always, I'm always uh, wondering when, uh, when Antonio comes up with something new, what he says, you know, doing two steps one, you know, forward and then one step back, we are used to that. And um, I remember the time, uh, Antonio, you know, <clears throat> you were always in favor of drug coated balloons uh, under certain um, circumstances, uh, such as distal disease, bifurcations, you were always in favor of that, and then and I inhaled that. <clears throat> the the full metal jacket. Um, I remember the time where you you did full metal jacket. We all did with uh, the question what the long term is. But I also remember when you said, you know, physiology is widely um, um, overrated. Um, if if you always apply it to to the lesions, you never get done. And now, you know, the step back, I assume, is that we do have this now because it's not new. We had it for quite some time. Uh, and now you're teaching us to go back, put two, two wires in there with a pressure wire, and then basically go back to physiology. At the, and according to physiology, um, and I, I assume the 10 millimeter mercury uh, gradient is kind of arbitrary and you're trying to find out what the real value is and you said 20 patients not enough and <clears throat> we're waiting for 100 patients. The problem you know with that is you're always on the forefront and you always know how to deal with uh, complications extremely well as we all know uh, and, and you almost always get out of it. The, the, the thing is for the ones that are either <clears throat> how can I say normal users uh, normally, normally skilled, um, would you still recommend to take your approach or is this just a stimulation of thoughts on do less stenting versus more physiology? Is that the, the goal that you're trying to teach us? No, I would, uh, I would like some expert uh, interventionist uh, take uh, this approach uh, in selected cases uh, when uh, they feel that placing stents uh, is not ideal. And they move uh, very slowly, but uh, they do <coughs> one case uh, the first <coughs> week, another case after two weeks, uh, and they follow the patient very carefully and uh, in, uh, if we do that uh, in, uh, in six months, uh, instead of 20 cases, uh, we, we may have uh, 200 cases. And if you do it slowly, and uh, I think uh, we learn that uh, this idea <coughs> of covering the lesion, all the lesion with the stent, uh, that every dissection is uh, uh, is negative, uh, that uh, uh, you have to stand from healthy to healthy. These are all concepts uh, that are just evidence-based C, double C. There is no good study. 
supporting these three basic concepts. So let's try to be a little bit uh, innovative and try to give some, but it's not the work that I can do alone. I need your help. So Antonio, I, I mean, is this something treating diffuse disease like this so it's very physiology based and i like that because we're trying to give it some for others a value something they can use to assess whether you have a good result and okay. um, can you only do this if you have drug coated balloons because the the premise of this is the fact that you're going to leave long segments of disease diffuse disease that you've dilated maybe caused micro dissections you're going to leave it uncovered with stents I mean, do you think that, and I have my own bias here, that you, you could only do this with drug coated balloons because we've not seen um, acute vessel closures when using drug coated balloons in native disease? Or do you think you can do this with normal balloons as well? And it's the fact that we have such good DAPT now that prevents acute vessel closure. I think uh, you need a drug coated balloon because uh, you have to try to prevent uh, negative remodeling. Uh, the acute vessel closure is uh, protected by the gradient. And uh, uh, the fact uh, that you have optimal dilatation is uh, uh, confirmed by the dissection. The dissection tells you that the lesion has been dilated optimally. And the drug coated balloon uh, is a protection against negative remodeling. So, uh, dissection protection for uh, a recoil. A pressure gradient is protection against occlusion. Drug coated balloon is protection against negative remodeling. So, these are the three ingredients. Sorry, um, Eberhard, you have you were going to make another comment before I cut you off. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, I mean, th there was a reason why we developed stents, you remember? And the reason that we developed stents was dissection. We realized at that time that we, by dissecting the vessel, we did something that we wanted to achieve, but there was some kind of unpredictability intersections. We do know, or we did know at that time, which was really ugly dissections, those spiral dissections and, and, and things like that. That I agree with. And not every dissection is the same. The problem for younger, for younger ones is to differentiate what dissection you have to treat and which dissection you have to leave alone. Because if you leave the wrong dissection alone, you have a vessel closure and you have something that's extremely difficult to rewire. So dissections in itself uh, ha, ha, is, is a good effect on what we did. But on the other hand, we have to have some kind of tool. And I guess what you did is by teaching us the pressure gradient of 10 uh, separates the dangerous from the non-dangerous dissections. Because honestly, I would hate to get simply what I could do, if, 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 if I'm judging the dissection wrongly, you have an infarct, uh, most likely anyway. And, uh, and that's something that we would like to prevent. And for me, it is not quite clear um, that the pressure gradient of 10 is just enough to say, okay, we leave it alone uh, and do some kind of watchful waiting uh, instead of having some kind of um, um, well, fear or, or uh, care that, you know, we don't leave something alone that might end up with an infarct. But, uh, you know, Eberhard, you are absolutely right. The only answer to your question is data. Mm -hmm. We need, yeah. uh, we need uh, more data, but uh, I tell you, especially the right coronary artery that I showed you, I had difficulties to get this patient discharged from the hospital. Nobody wanted to discharge the patient. <laughs> the patient stayed in the hospital five days. And uh, 
when I when I left uh, Cotignola, uh, they called the patient down in the lab and they did a repeat angiogram <laughs> without telling me. And the artery was still open. And then they decided to discharge the patient. <laughs> so I I totally agree that we are, but you know, you have to we have to do it. If we don't do it, uh, nothing happens. Uh, we are just bang, 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 shoveling stents everywhere. <laughs> Look, don't get me wrong, Antonio. That's why. That's why. No, no. I, I agree with you, people. but that's the reason why we need data. We need more data, and the only way to get data is to do to acquire data. We can make up data. So, uh, but we have to be careful because uh, we are not uh, doing a trial. We are treating patients, so we have to uh, slowly find the patient where the cost benefit is balanced. And you cannot find this patient every day, but if we work carefully, we will find in a busy activity patient where the cost benefit is acceptable to take the chance, but only when it's acceptable. And then when we have 100, 150, I don't know what is the, the number, then uh, we can uh, uh, put uh, our spreadsheet. Uh, I, I'm, we need zero event, zero occlusion. Eh? We cannot uh, have uh, one or two, because yeah. if we have one or two is no good. We have to have zero, but that's the reason why I think we need uh, 10. And uh, even if 15 is okay, I want to be, absolutely safe and I think 10 is safe and we need to remeasure the gradient after 10 15 minutes because in my I've been doing this for years I tell you but I never did systematically now I do it systematically if the gradient is 10 15 minutes stable it will stay stable if the gradient destabilize destabilize in 10 15 minutes so Azim, you have worked with Antonio for many, many years. <clears throat> and you sometimes have gone through agony and sometimes the joy, as we have looking at, looking at him. And, and Antonio, that's that's what in, in who Antonio is. He's just never um, you know, satisfied with what we have achieved. So he always wants to push the border. You know, you've you've worked with him um, in, in in many 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 years, and you know, and, and followed him in terms of different approaches <clears throat> to different lesions. Uh, coming back to the full metal stenting, um, I, I, I by the way, I fully agree with full metal stenting. But there was a time that we did it. We optimally prepared the lesions. Um, we did well, we did with IVIS, good expansions, and you know, that's what he taught us. And if you have a long stent um, or a real long stent, like say 28, 36, 36 or something like that, if you do real good lesion preparation, you are happy with the, the post IVIS uh, or with the post implant result by IVIS, would you, would you be satisfied Taking the, I mean, taking this or discharging this patient safely and say, okay, there is a certain amount of restenosis, but it is controlled. <clears throat> we have to deal with this when it comes, but chances are high. Instead of going with uh, a drug coated balloon, I mean, in the in, in in the lower part of the LED, for example, or bifurcations. What's what, what's your take on this? Yeah, my yeah, my question. take. Uh... My take, ever. first of all, thank you so much for being with us uh, because your presence is key. Uh, my take uh, is uh, first, uh, we need uh, to do a, a registry to make sure that our approach is safe. Mm -hmm. If our approach is safe, the second step is to select uh, long lesion that need uh, long stents and do a randomized study where we evaluate uh, this approach 
to the standard optimal stenting approach and do a follow-up for non-inferiority at one year and superiority at four years. Because I think at four years, long stenting will fall behind this approach. But you have to wait four or five years. Yeah. You know, Everhard, when I got to um, Milano, um, I think within the first two years, one of the first papers I was involved in publishing was our long-term data with full metal jackets, right? And we published many studies on full metal jackets in Milano um, with right. decent outcomes, okay? Um, and probably we encouraged a lot of people in the world to, they followed suit, seeing us do it in live cases and so on. Um, I have to tell you that, you know, with time, even my approach has changed because I think it's one thing when Antonio puts in 60 millimeters of stent or you put in 60 millimeters of stent or I do. Um, I see a lot of patients coming back with full metal jackets now who the vessels occluded. And, you, and once, you know, they have these diffuse restenoses or occlusive restenoses, it's just impossible to keep this vessel open. I mean, you know, we went through a lot of different phases in this journey to try and stop full metal jackets. So we, we started and we published paper on using a combination of DES and of drug eluding stents and drug coated balloons. I don't know if Antonio remembers, almost about eight years ago already, six, seven years ago, we published it in Jack Intervention, Antonio. Um, and we showed that by using drug coated balloons, you decrease the amount of stents uh, and stent length by at least half uh, with Dr. Kostopoulos, one of our fellows. Then we went to using full plastic jackets, right? And using, you, you remember very well the cases, yeah. the live cases at PCR, TCT, gym, where we covered the whole vessel with BVS, you know? And those patients are doing well too. But once again, it was because it was implanted in very good centers who did a very good job with it. And the results are not, um, I think, reproducible. I think when I think about all those little steps of how we've been trying to be more or put less metal in the artery, I don't think we've ever had a truly systematic approach though, right? So we've not had criteria to say, this vessel, okay, you can leave, or this vessel, you should stent, or you should extend. And what I'm hoping to get out of this data with Antonio is the fact that maybe we can make this more systematic, that we can give criteria and guidelines to our colleagues and our younger colleagues out there that allows them to do this in a systematic way. So, because unfortunately, like many things we've said before, it's no good if it only works in Antonio's hands or my hands or your hands. For therapy, or something innovative in coronaries to be successful, it has to be successful in the hands of most and many different people who do complex disease. And so I think Antonio, you know, it's very important that you come out of this with, I think, very good criteria of how we do this. Um, yeah. And whether that's 10 or 15, I'm gonna switch a little bit um, because I've never seen so many questions Yes. Uh, in yeah. the chat and the Q&A, Antonio. So I'm going to switch to Manaf. Uh, Manaf, uh, we only have 20 minutes. So I'm not sure we'll get to all of them, but some of them can maybe combined into one question because they are some, um, they are some repeat questions. Thank you again, Dr. Colombo, for a, a really fascinating talk and for, for forcing us to think about uh, what we do um, more uh, deeply. Um, one of my questions is, um, do, you, do you apply this strategy um, to minimize stenting uh, with, with um, stent edge dissections that you may see in a more routine type of case? Do you try to avoid um, uh, you know, overlap stenting the uh, uh, visible stent edge dissection, which is something that is um, usually taught? But if I, have, if I have an edge dissection, which I can cover with a 12 millimeter stent, that's it. Don't even waste time to measure the pressure gradient. Put a 12 millimeter stent, period. And I'm not trying to go against stenting. So if, the, if, uh, 
if the extra money to pay is one dollar, put a dollar, it's okay. Don't don't get upset because you have to place another eight millimeter stent. Place an eight millimeter stent, cover the dissection and call the next patient. Okay, thank you. Um, a question uh, in the chat um, about um, using, uh, is there, first of all, is there a difference in, uh, th that you've seen in the uh, different drugs, paclitaxel or spirolimus, drug-coated balloons, do you have a preference? And similarly, if you have a stent that has, uh, if you've used a stent that is uh, spirolimus, uh, Eluding, would you would you choose a, uh, a balloon that is using the same drug or a different drug, or is there no no uh, relevance it's there? Recognosis, you mean? Okay, yeah. but nowadays and nowadays right. we only use a Sirolimus uh, drug drug coated balloon. Uh, but if you have uh, Paclitaxel, it's fine. I think uh, there's nothing wrong. But uh, we have uh, uh, Limus, and we don't uh, really go to the to the idea to use a different drug, a drug called a Sirolimus and the Paclitax. So um, we don't do that. So basically we use the Limus coated balloon and Limus coated stent. There's a lot Thank of questions, you. Antonio, mm -hmm. about how you prepare the vessel. I mean, you know, it, before putting the dark coated balloon, do you use non-compliant, do you use cutting, do you use pouring balloons? Is there a oh, higher yeah. risk of dissection if you use a cutting versus a non-compliant? No, no. We, we, do not, uh, we do not try to avoid dissections. We try to avoid vessel rupture. But uh, if the lesion needs a dissection uh, to, to be dilated, uh, you have to dilate. And we are not uh, against uh, stenting. We believe uh, that uh, with this approach, uh, you will have at least 30% to 40% crossover to stenting. Some stent will be, again, a long stent. Uh, some stent will be short uh, and some will be no stent. But the crossover strategy uh, is part of the business. So it's not uh, stenting again drug coated balloon. It's one strategy versus uh, the routine strategy. The routine strategy is when you see the section, red light, stent. This strategy, when you see the section, if the dissection is short, stent, period. If the dissection is long or if you have long stents to place, then go to evaluate the dissection and see if you can avoid placing a long stent. This is the algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Colombo, do you ever um, um, change your, your DAPT strategy based on, um, based on whether uh, you're using the struck coated balloon um, strategy to avoid further stenting. And also, is there, have, have you considered the possibility in one of the questions is asking whether you think that it's possible that the pressure wire is, for example, um, uh, scaffolding or holding open uh, a dissection flap, um, which, which may then come down when you, when you pull that second wire out. If it has, um, I know you said in your 20 patients so far, you haven't seen that. Um, if you have any comments on, on that possibility. Uh, yeah, the dual antiplatelet strategy, I, unless the patient has a real high risk of bleeding and so far I did not have, I continue at least for six months. Just because I want to be very safe. Uh, at the moment, I, I believe that one month is most probably adequate, but I'm not trying to do it now. So now I keep for six months, at least, sometimes even longer, but at least six months. Uh, the, uh, the idea that uh, a wire uh, will uh, scaffold the dissection, I don't, I never had that. 
uh, I do this uh, practice uh, of angioplasty for 30 years uh, and I never had uh, a dissection scaffolded by the wire. Antonio, that's the teaching, right? I mean, all around the world, even the books teach that you always do your last angiogram without the wire because maybe the wire is holding up a dissection flap. So we've been all learning the wrong things? I always do my last angiogram with a wire in place. <laughs> and uh, I've been uh, repeatedly <laughs> reprimanded by Dr. Moses uh, when I was in <laughs> Colombia by doing that. <laughs> but, you know, uh, he reprimanded, but the guiding catheter was already out. <laughs> so, he kept on doing that, but he was never able to convince me. Uh, so, uh, and, and I've been doing this for 30 years. So um, I don't have a randomized study, but no. I have a 30 years experience of doing the last angiogram with a wire in place. <laughs> Uh, okay. What about, I was just talking about the DAPT, um, would it make sense? I mean, come on, we, I, and I'm pushing you, you know, one of the things I love about you is that we've always um, had the ability to challenge each other. So I, I continue to challenge you. Um, people will be worried about this approach. You leave in the sections. The biggest, I mean, the biggest concern that any physician has about this approach is having an infarct, an acute vessel closure. What about giving these patients ticagrel or rather? And, you know, really making sure they have the most potent antiplatelet therapy we have. Um, and particularly in this early part of the study that you're doing, you know, this is really pushing the limits. Why not put them on ticagrel and really, you know, have them, take even lessen the risk as much as possible. Absolutely, absolutely. I agree. I agree. I think at this point, giving Ticagalo is an excellent idea. And I do it. I do say it when I have very bad, you know, I'm, uh, I'm moving in a very unsecure water. So I need the maximum protection. My goal uh, is not to show that you don't need antiplatelet. You need profound antiplatelet. Uh, the Paul Bargan, who, who told me about Ticlid, Ticlopidin, he was using a Ticlopidin without stenting in dissections. He didn't measure the pressure gradient, nothing. He, but he was firmly believer with the, the teclopidin would prevent closure, and he was right. So I think uh, uh, good antiplatelet therapy is good. Nevertheless, nevertheless, we need to make sure that the dissection is benign. Uh, we need extra protection, uh, but uh, we cannot rely on antiplatelet therapy only. If the dissection is bad, we should stand. But I tell you, there is plenty of benign dissections that uh, uh, on angiogram look uh, not beautiful, but they behave okay. So beauty is not the only quality. They are so nice, uh, uh, not beautiful people that are nice people. When <laughs> um, so, Dr. Colombo, how far down, Dr. Menegas asks, how far down the coronary tree, as we have less and less myocardium supplied by any given vessel, can we still expect to find this 10 millimeter gradient? And is there a point after which, for example, in the apical or distal LAD, where this becomes less useful or less applicable? But that's the reason why uh, I utilize uh, uh, PAPD, PAPD, uh, PA because when you are evaluating a, a distal dissection, you need to measure the pressure proximal to the dissection and the pressure right distal to the dissection. And the gradient between the proximal, uh, if you measure FFR, you, you evaluate the old diffuse disease, it's a different story. But that's the beauty for my approach will be to have 
a pressure wire, a pressure catheter, like the assist, where you can maneuver easily uh, on the wire without removing the wire, but by measuring the pressure at different spots. That will be beautiful. There is a, now a, a pressure catheter from China. We will get it uh, in October and uh, we will uh, evaluate that it is a very advanced uh, micro catheter. Uh, very nice. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, so you don't need the two wires. You don't need to remove your wire and you can reliably measure the pressure at different steps uh, along the vessel length. That would be nice. So you can kind of do a pullback, right? Yes, uh, you can do a pullback, stop where you have the dissection, measure the pressure, go a little bit more distant, measure the pressure again, wait five minutes, do it again, and check. Stability with time is a key. Because I think that's... That, uh... that is, uh, if you see, for example, that uh, initially is 10, you wait uh, 10 minutes is 15, no good, bad yeah. smell. I mean, you know, I think that's kind of what's missing a little bit uh, from this is maybe the integration of a pullback, right? To, yeah. to Because it may tell you certain areas that are more at risk than other areas, but in, you know, with the current wire technology we have and the fact that you may have longish dissections, it's challenging to pull this wire back, rewire, pull it back, rewire. Yes, 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 uh, yeah, 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 no good, no good. Yeah. If you do that, if you do that, you keep on going into the false lumen, you make a mess. Yeah, uh, absolutely. No <laughs> good. Don't do that, don't do that. But that's the reason why you can break the balloon and do this like man <laughs> business. But, you know, you guys should do something of this. Uh, let me know in, in one month uh, what happened. Yeah. But be so that, I... don't, don't kill the, the small child. Uh, take it uh, with uh, a lot of attention because it's very easy to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. Take it uh, with care, it's fragile. This concept is still open to debate. Yeah, well. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have, you know, drug coated balloons here available on my shelf, Antonio. Otherwise, you know me. I'm always uh, there yeah, with but you. Wait, wait, uh, wait. Maybe you do this and then stand anyway, but yeah. start doing to, uh, to refine your knowledge. Then place a stand anyway, but you will see how many poor results will show a, a nice pressure gradient. And then uh, if you want even to go further, do IBUS and you will see that the low pressure gradient is associated with a large true lumen or with a very large connection between dissection and true lumen. So the mm -hmm. dissection becomes like something floating, but not uh, occlusive. The, the dissection is not a foreign body. so. Uh, the, the corner is, uh, does not react as aggressively when you have a foreign body as uh, uh, when you have a dissection. If it's I mean, the one area where I'm doing it routinely already, Antonio, is uh, when I do left main stenting for the left circumflex. I, oh, wow. you know, I, for me to put a stent uh, into the circumflex, uh, whether it's a crush or T or anything, I, I really ponder it and, and evaluate it very well. And I went both IVUS and FFR convincing me that the results I have with ballooning is suboptimal that I have to put a stent. Uh, so that's an area where I think, you know, already now um, uh, we should be using both the, you know, IVUS and FFR to be sure we can leave a, a balloon result and not put a stent. Good. Yeah. Uh, Manaf, go ahead. I think we have time for one or two more questions, Manaf. I have one more question to Antonio. Yeah. Um, Antonio, when, you know, suppose the, 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 the scaffolds are coming back. 
um, would you still follow the same path or would you say a full scaffold jacket is different from a full metal jacket? I, I, I will follow the same path. I think I will use scaffolds to do focus tenting. But I think the more foreign body you place, the more risk you have yeah. of acute and long-term event. So I think limit the foreign body, even if it's bioresorbable, is better. Um, and uh, we will get there. I tell you, we will get there. We will get there. These long stents. I I placed long stents for years. <laughs> you know, to place, uh, take long balloons and attach multiple short stents to create long stents. <laughs> Is that what? You... <laughs> okay. Okay. And then now. Um, how about in osteocircumflex uh, lesions, sort of a little bit separate from your talk, but in terms of trying to avoid stenting in places where stenting is um, not performed well, do you um, like the drug-coated balloons in, in those particular lesion subsets? Ab absolutely, absolutely. I think uh, the recipe for the osteocircumflex lesion is uh, Ivus uh, cutting balloon aggressively uh, evaluation by Ivus uh, and if you want the uh, pressure and the drug coated balloon. Osteocircumflex denting uh, is not so so good. But uh, you know, I just uh, I don't know, I just reviewed the paper. I cannot say because I reviewed the paper is not uh, published, so forget. But uh, I reviewed the paper which is interesting. <laughs> okay. Um, Manav, any burning last final questions before we close? I think that's all. Uh, it was a wonderful talk, Dr. Colombo. Thank you very yeah. much. I think, Antonio, you really, once again, you never stop. I don't know where you get the energy from uh, to continue to innovate, to challenge us, to, to force us. We may not agree with you. I mean, many people, I'm sure, who, who listen may not agree and may not introduce this as a practice, but I would say to those people too, to just take this to challenge, you know, we all need to challenge our own way of thinking. And particularly when what we're doing isn't really working or isn't giving the outcomes we want. Um, this may be one strategy or this may lead us into an even better strategy as we move forward, but it's only through challenging the norm that we come up with these ideas. So um, thank you for forcing us to do that. Um, you know now that you know, you've caused so much discussion about this that you're going to have to come back and show us some data as you get more data, particularly the long-term data. So, you know, the, the shock factor for some of the people who join will be lessened by the fact that there is clinical data to support the approach. And I know you, the one thing we've always done in Milano or working together is we've always been very transparent about the data, whether it's good or bad. Uh, Absolutely. So. Absolutely. I... I will give, give you the data. I will move slowly because uh, I put myself uh, as uh, being a patient. So I don't want to take any risk to the patient. And uh, I, I hope to be right, but uh, I, can, uh, I can be wrong. And uh, nothing wrong. Uh, to be wrong. Uh, it's better not to be wrong, but... Uh, <laughs> okay. uh, just for the sake of our patient, I hope not to be wrong. Ciao. Everett, any final comments? Well, thank you very much. It was great, as always. Thank you very much. It was fantastic. Uh, thank you, Eberat. Eberat, you had, I did not expect uh, you still interested in corners. I think uh, <laughs> that's a good friend. Azim was surprised, too, when I asked him for Skype. <laughs> I think that's a good friend that you care to <laughs> listen uh, for 45 minutes about coronaries. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you one last thing. Do me a favor. Say hi to the team at Columbus from me, okay? Uh, okay I, I will. I will. Okay. Ciao. Ciao. Okay. Ciao. 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 Ciao.